okay good evening and after all the hassles <laughs> we are talking to each other yeah. and uh, as it was decided i am going to talk on uh, intraocular infections particularly especially in hematological patient and uh, we will uh, see one by one what are the problem actually first of all uh, a brief introduction about ocular tissues or what is intraocular actually all ocular infection can be classified into two categories one is extraocular or adnexal and another is intraocular intraocular may be viral bacterial fungal or protozoal but mostly it is viral bacterial or fungal therefore we are only talking today about intraocular and only viral bacterial and fungal protozoals are very rare and in our experience here or elsewhere uh, i have not seen any protozoal so far intraocular protozoal infection in immunocompromised at but these three are uh, seen and uh, on the rise actually and a brief uh, look at the uh, ocular structure what is intraocular and what is extraocular and what is anterior segment and so on so there are two cavities inside the eyeball one is vitreous cavity that is larger one and another is anterior segment that is our anterior chamber that is a smaller one and all the purple uh, purple arrows are the structures that are intraocular that is ciliary body iris lens and anterior chamber choroid retina and optic nerve these structures are intraocular structure and all the green arrows that the, all the structures uh, that are indicated by green arrows are extraocular tissue that is conjunctiva cornea and sclera so now we are clear what is the intraocular and what is the extraocular. If anything happened to the this uh, 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 purple arrows uh, structures, that is intraocular involvement, and anything if happens to the green arrowed uh, uh, structure, that is extraocular involvement. Now the intraocular infection can be in the form of anterior uveitis, that is, if the ciliary body, iris, pupil, or anterior chamber is involved it is anterior if anything happened to these three structures that is choroid retina or macula that is in, uh, that is chorioretinitis or posterior involvement it, and involvement of vitreous body in the inflammation is endophthalmitis but anyway eye is such a close compartment that anterior uveitis chorioretinitis or endophth endophthalmitis including endosinate endophthalmitis usually progress into each other if any one of these is involved and so this division is uh, uh, largely artificial in most of the cases one uh, involvement anterior uveitis if it is infective no doubt it will progress to chorioretinitis and in the end endophthalmitis and particularly in hematological disorders where it is assumed that patient is already immunosuppressed not uh, even if they are not on any immunosuppressive agent the digit itself involves the immune system, most of the disease of hematology, and it is a grave emergency. Intraocular involvement in hematological disorder is the grave serious emergency. And now uh, uh, I am coming to directly to endogenous endophthalmitis. That is the most common type of endophthalmitis that is found in systemic diseases. Other are traumatic and post-operative. Post-operative means after cataract surgery. That is not the, uh, the topic of discussion today. That is an entirely different thing. We are concerned uh, about the endogenous endophthalmitis that is spreads through the blood stream. So why we should uh, uh, why we should uh, study uh, all these uh, intra uh, endogenous and uh, all these things because endogenous endophthalmitis is certainly blinding and potentially life threatening and only thing only yeah, only good thing coming out of this it is but it actually it is very rare now first come to the viral viral uh, intraocular infections and uh, it, this potentially life threatening one uh, most of the studies coming out of hematology also and uh, no doubt uh, of uh, end of thalmitis studies itself have recorded the increase we will see later in this presentation the most common type of viral infection in 
I in immunocompromised or in hematological disorders or kidney transplant or solid organ or a, a transplantation, BMT, etc. is CMB, cytomegalovirus infection. And uh, Weller is the credited, uh, Weller is the, uh, uh, said to discover this, uh, first time discovered this cytomegalovirus and awarded Nobel Prize for this. This is the first uh, report of ocular involvement by the cytomegalovirus infection in 1964. The zero prevalence all over the world is 100%. In India, it's 100%. Uh, in homosexual, it is definitely 100%. In rest of the population, it varies between 90 to 100%. That terms used in CMB retinitis or CMB infections are very important. The, if you search the literature, these terms are used uh, differently in different literature and it's cre creating a lot of confusion. So zero positivity means there is IgG antibodies are present in the serum of the an individual. It means at least that person is in, infected once in his lifetime. Primary infection, primary infection is actually nothing but the first infection or in the immunocompetent, it is totally asymptomatic. And they, it also implies that there is no prior immunity. And uh, after this infection, the IgG, IgM, uh, IgM is transient. IgG antibodies uh, comes into the bloodstream. Now, the latent is infection. Latent infection is nothing. But this primary infection in immunocompetent goes, become dormant. You can't get any evidence apart from CMB IgG in, uh, into the bloodstream or in any individual. Viral genome is even not detected by PCR if it is latent. And this is the case with immunocompetent. By cytopathology, you can't culture the virus even by PCR. Only IgG you can detect and nothing else. Secondary infection is nothing. Secondary infection means the Primary infection when become active means that this latent or this dormant uh, CMV virus now start uh, replicating whether uh, in, in immunocompetent or in immunocompromised. There are various factors that uh, that is responsible for this transition from latent to secondary. And in the secondary infection means where virus is actively start replicating. Here you can detect the viral genome by PCR. PCR. And the super infection, and the super infection. Is, okay, uh, now uh, 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 this, uh, these are all these terminologies, but we are concerned with these two things. Latent infection, that means primary infection happened. That is the case with every individual in the world. And in immunocompetent, it goes dormant. You, uh, there is no evidence of any infection apart from IgG antibodies. Now this latent infection or the infection we have encountered first time, if it started, uh, virus become non-dormant, virus become active, uh, active and it is started replicating, that is called the secondary infection. Secondary inf infection does not mean the second infection. It is the reactivation of the first infection. In immunocompetent, once infected, there is on and off asymptomatic uh, setting of CNV ha may happen, but usually it is asymptomatic on and off virus may get activated and they start replicating, but uh, automatically it gets dormant. And this is the cause of the, uh, and in this way, this uh, virus keeps uh, their population or uh, uh, keeps uh, its uh, replicating, uh, replicating cycle in the nature in immunocompetent. And this horizontal transmission is ensured that this virus gets passed on from one generation to another. And if uh, and uh, bisexual preferences, homosexuality is the most uh, uh, common cause of uh, this horizontal uh, transmitter apart from the uh, mother to baby. What triggers are there for the activation is not known. In immunocompetent, it's a cellular Im immunity that controls the viral replication and induces the latency. And this is the uh, summar summary of what I have told. The host is uh, uh, immunocompetent host is infected. Latency is, uh, there is induced. And the uh, virus is kept into the CD34 progenitor cells in the bone marrow. And some evidence about that vascular endothelium also uh, store these viruses. 
but if reactivation happened by any chance then in, in, in immunocompetent it is asymptomatic and automatically gets uh, again uh, into the inactive mode or latency induced but if immunocompromised a lot of problems happens as you can see the cmv retinitis is the most common cmv disease in the immunocompromised or overall cmv uh, this is the most common cmv disease but it can in fact, in ca it, it can make uh, any organ diseased, as you see the list from top to bottom. Any organ can be infected and can be attacked by the CMV once it uh, gets activated. Now, therefore, I am uh, just talking about this CMVR. Uh, CMVR, CMV retinitis is the purely clinical diagnosis. And the one feature that is the constant is the full thickness retinal necrosis with retinal vasculitis, either venous side or uh, arterial side. But these white areas, you can uh, what you are seeing on the screen is the full thickness retinal necrosis. And because of vascular vasculitis, there is a, uh, there may be uh, hemorrhages and uh, exudates, et cetera. And this, uh, yeah. and this, uh, this appearance is what is called tomato ketchup appearance. You can see it is just blood is splashed uh, uh, as like uh, it is the tomato ketchup has been splashed uh, on something. And this is purely clinical diagnosis, but only way to confirm that uh, by the way of CMV PCR, either on blood or ocular fluid. If there is a, if uh, we can get the genome of the uh, CMV, anti, uh, CMV virus in uh, any fluid of the body, it is the confirmatory that CMV is replicating and it's get a secondary disease has happened. Uh, this is the brief about uh, how this uh, viral genome gets activated. And uh, actually in, uh, in very brief, actually in the immunocompetent, this CD34 cells, inside the CD34 cells, the human, there are uh, human cellular proteins that binds to the viral genome and in latency is induced. But by any cause, when this CD34 cells are differentiated in, into dendritic cells or macrophages, these proteins fail and virus start replicating. And this is the reactivation of the virus. This is just, uh, it has been shown that this is CD34, this is progenitor cells in latency. But whatever factors, these are the factors. These are a lot of uh, human uh, normal uh, cellular proteins binding to this uh, viral genome and the replication is stopped. But whenever this balance is disturbed, this dendritic cells or macrophage uh, trans uh, transformation happens and this virus becomes activated. CMV was the disease of HIV patients before 2000. But after 2000, the load of CMV has gone almost negligible in HIV population because of heart, but on the contrary, it is increasing in immunocompetent uh, non-HIV persons. Non-HIV persons immunocompromised by the mostly by the drugs, uh, post transplant or uh, uh, for any other regions uh, where the immunosuppression is given, and it is the mainly nowadays a mainly problem of the immunocompetence or immunocompromised, non-HIV immunocompromised. And uh, as, as, we, as we can see, uh, these are the, uh, uh, these are the time, uh, this is the timeline and uh, actually how the first, uh, from the first case to the 2000, we have progressed so far. Now, actually this, one uh, in immunocompromise, uh, getting CMV reactivated is one thing. But nowadays, what is happening, we are giving a lot of antiviral prophylaxis. Uh, uh, we, uh, when it, uh, it becomes our knowledge that after post-transplantation, intense immunosuppressive are given, CMV uh, infections are very common, CMV disease is very common. Then we started giving antiviral prophylaxis. And just, uh, after, just after transplantation, we started but it, it has given rise to a new, new type of phenomenon. As, as far as antiviral therapy is going on, there is no symptoms, no clinical symptoms, no disease. But, but, as, soon, but as soon as this uh, antiviral prophylaxis stops, when, we, uh, when this uh, 
and immunosuppression gets down and we is, we think that uh, now the cmv uh, risk is uh, decreased we, as soon as we stop the this anti viral prophylaxis the risk of this late onset disease starts even when the even when this immunosuppression gets down but as if we have given the antiviral prophylaxis the late onset disease this is a new kind new subset of the disease has been comes into the picture as soon as soon as it, antiviral prophylaxis is stopped even when immunosuppression is not so intense but the cmb become active and cmb disease happens so this is the actually complication of antiviral prophylaxis we have seen and this prompted us to give uh, instead of continuous prophylaxis just post transplantation preemptive therapy as you can see we start pre we start uh, antiviral therapy only when we we do a, a regular serial uh, pcr testing and as as soon as we get first sample positive we start antiviral therapy for some time then again we get negative uh, pcr then we stop if again it becomes positive we give the ant antiviral therapy and this late onset cmb disease once prophylaxis was started antiviral uh, we thought that it is controlled now but nowadays the late onset cmb disease is observed very increasingly and this is not trivial phenomena just see the figures it it is the uh, load is very high in hemato hematopoietic stem cell transplant patients of the late onset and in solid organ transplantation it's uh, almost uh, in all patients and this uh, problem with this late onset disease is it is the atypical manifestation and it is very difficult uh, to uh, evaluate cl clinically and diagnose clinically because uh, uh, sim uh, features are not uh, as uh, typical as in uh, uh, early onset disease now uh, i'm coming to this uh, antiviral uh, treatment i'm sorry actually i could not see you the mo uh, many of the fundus photographs uh, of my patient because uh, actually uh, archit is knowing we have uh, our one of the article is getting published and in, it is in publication process so those uh, images uh, I, it is not possible to show here i'm, I'm sorry for that actually actually aim of what is the aim of antiviral treatment aim of antiviral treatment is only one that reinduce the virus latency as in immunocompetence we can't eradicate we can't get rid of virus anybody in the world cannot do this we only what whatever viral replications have been started we can stop the replication and induce the viral uh, latency whatever treatment modalities we have now as of now and the most and that that is the reason the most of the drugs are virostatic only in the nature nature and uh, one thing is the antiviral agents and another thing simultaneously we uh, uh, recently we have tried to increase the cellular Im uh, immunity or uh, 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 reinforce the cellular uh, immunity once again so that virus is made latent by immunity itself antiviral is one thing and this is there is two prong approach you can see but cellular Im immunity reconstitution is still in infancy and the antiviral drugs are the most common way of controlling the viral replication and along in this way uh, along with this if we can preserve the vision and uh, reduce the risk of cmb related visual complication that is very nice but our aim is uh, the saving the globe saving the eye globe first rather than pre uh, prevent uh, preserving the vision because that's uh, that, uh, that that is not possible in most of the cases preventing the uh, uh, eye globe and so the disfigurement uh, disfigurement of face could not be there that is our main aim there is no guidelines available for cmv retinitis treatment and the most common uh, way of treating these patients are the antiviral agents by way of intravenous infusions plus or oral and along with intravitreal antivirals and uh, there is lot of uh, uh, actually given the patient con patient's condition uh, at the time of diagnosis at the time of treatment uh, we have to make many choices that but the gold standard is the uh, give the systemic as well as intravitreal both but sometimes systemic giving the systemic is not possible for by uh, because of many of reasons sometimes intravitreal cannot be given because patient is not in such a, a patient is in icu in ccm and patient cannot be shifted to the ot etc etc 
but anyway this is the uh, standard of treatment the agents available for uh, this cmb retinitis treatment are these gancyclovir val uh, valgancyclovir and uh, valgancyclovir is given uh, since it is oral it is uh, now the you know, most preferred drug uh, given systematically uh, and uh, gancyclovir was earlier when valgan was not available was given intravenous and the three drugs uh, uh, those are in red color is reserved drug at present actually and uh, all these are approved uh, fda approved but but uh, this this last one this final one uh, uh, leflunomide is uh, not uh, approved, but it is off label used particularly in India because of um, cost considerations. I will discuss uh, in coming slides. So these are the these are the agents available, and uh, valgan uh, is the most commonly used for systemic application, and gancyclovir is the most common agent used in tabitrial. This is these are the doses and uh, uh, of these drugs uh, and uh, actually uh, uh, gancyclovir implant or and fomiviracin is not available commercially now so we are not uh, going to uh, talk about this actually uh, uh, the gancyclovir is the very good drug for cmb uh, cmvr only thing myelosuppression in hematological patients uh, the use is always uh, 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 you know the difficulty in using all these drugs and thrombocytopenia associated. So uh, in uh, many a times uh, these drugs create a problem of this sort. But what is the good, uh, better things of this drug? It, it is active against all herpes viruses and uh, simplex joster, EMP, BB, and CMB all. And this, uh, the, this, uh, this is the drug that uh, at the initial phase of the viral replication, it attacks that viral kinases or uh, uh, you know, it binds to the viral kinases and uh, triphosphate, gancyclovir triphosphate that is active drug and the further cycles uh, are broken. This cycle is broken and viral cannot replicate uh, further. But myelosuppression is the big issue with this drug. Actually, valgancyclovir is the prodrug of gancyclovir, and uh, because of oral uh, oral uh, route, uh, give, uh, it can be given through oral route. The compliance is very good, and uh, uh, and the uh, side effects. Uh, our experience also in this center that side effects are not as common with valgancyclovir. Uh, sorry, uh, gancyclovir given intravenous when uh, valgancyclovir is started. Patients also look uh, comfortable uh, on uh, visits. So uh, reason, uh, I don't know. But resistance is also repeated frequently. Our experience is not, uh, there is no resistant cases we have seen so far. We have seen uh, uh, in the last three years, six cases of this CMB retinitis and all, the, uh, and all these non-HIV non cases. One case was uh, HIV positive, but uh, that was very serious patient, and, and, and I think he is no more now. But uh, the majority of patients were, uh, six patients were uh, two cases from hematology site, and three, uh, sorry, three from hematocyte, and uh, three from the, uh, the renal post-renal transplant. And actually, uh, and uh, we, we don't have any gancy, all are treated uh, and all are cured with gancyclovir only and valgancyclovir only. And uh, uh, this uh, phoscornate is reserved for the gancyclovir resistance. And uh, actually, uh, phoscornate acts upon this uh, this uh, uh, final stages of the replication, and it uh, directly inhibits the DNA polymerase of the virus, and therefore it is more effective and uh, uh, more resistant uh, to the resistance uh, development because it directly attacks the polymerase. So uh, 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 since uh, genome is destroyed, so the possibility of uh, uh, possibility of uh, uh, creating resistance from the virus is uh, almost getting negligible. Actually, acidophobia uh, is a good, very good drug, but the problem this uh, nephrotoxicity. So at here also the uh, uh, nephrology persons are very averse of this drug. And even the many trials have been stopped because of very high, uh, high degree of nephrotoxicities with this drug. 
and one from ocular side one problem is this there is the persistent anterior uveitis the inflammation does not go away virus may be may be gone away because of this drug since i have not used this drug but the reports say that uh, even uh, everything is uh, fine the anterior uveitis does not resolve and the low grade anterior uveitis is present as, as far as this uh, treatment is going on so uh, at present this is a, a, a barely used drug actually this is a uh, leflunomide is the off level at present and it it does not attack on the viral genome this attack it this actually uh, 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 this uh, inhibit the virus assembly and uh, this uh, uh, this inhibition lead to the uh, non infective or, uh, or uh, you can say dead uh, particles uh, or non active particles of uh, virus being generated it is actually used off label in indian patients by indian uh, because of uh, this uh, uh, it, this is much cheaper than the earlier um, drugs and uh, uh, and also uh, long term suppression uh, is uh, 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 reported in drug resistant uh, that is the drug resistant cases also respond well to this drug but there is no trial available just a few uh, cases are reported from india so we have to wait for uh, this drug ocular uh, the there are uh, some benefits uh, uh, if cmv retinitis is there along with systemic you have to have give the uh, intravitreal because of obvious uh, advantages the high concentration of drug can be reached directly at the target there is minimal systemic toxicity even when you cannot give the systemic treatment we can we can continue with intravitreal and that is the uh, very good thing actually in many the cases where uh, i mean myelosuppression or uh, so on uh, intravitreal uh, does not uh, uh, does not leak into the systemic circulation and there is barely any systemic toxicity but uh, uh, implants are no longer available commercially but uh, the uh, reconstituted drug acts very well and uh, uh, and uh, it gets very good results but only problem is that uh, uh, other eye cannot be protected in normal eye or uninvolved eye it does not give any protection while systemic treatment uh, as you know uh, it gives the protection to whatsoever degree to both eyes actually homivirusin is not available commercially nowadays so yeah. now it is the drug treatment now as i say people said why for it is the cellular immunity that induces the latency so why we are giving drug why we we cannot uh, upregulate the immunity itself that again the if virus is now replicating because of depressed immunity it can uh, uh, we can upgrade the cellular immunity that it can again uh, go into latency and there are a uh, few options that is tried and with good results but prospective trials are not there one is the t cell mediated immunity against uh, to achieve t cell mediated immunity this is the adopted sorry adoptive transfer of cmv cmv specific donor cytotoxic t lymphocytes this is the this is given intra uh, this is the first reported intravenous but few people have given intravitreal also no controlled or prospective trials are available only case reports it is ad administ uh, administered intravenous this uh, donor toxocytic uh, cytotoxic t lymphocytes and first it was reported for only non ocular cases non ocular cmv disease and uh, it was effective in uh, people have shown it is effective in decreasing viral titers and uh, uh, and uh, uh, P pcr copies uh, are getting low after this treatment that is indicative of the control of infection but one single case of long term success one only one case is reported into the cmvr and that also report the six month up to six month there was no recurrence that is a very good period if there is no recurrence of the uh, transfer of uh, this uh, cmv specific t lymphocytes that was given intravitreal and this was the case actually uh, uh, it achieves the full uh, uh, you can see the top ones are the uh, pre uh, intravitreal injection and bottom one is the bottom ones are the uh, six weeks later after this uh, intravitreal injection 
and you can see the uh, the this uh, active areas have completely gone out and uh, is, uh, this uh, retina is relatively very healthy and uh, and as per uh, um, uh, as per uh, researchers uh, the up to 6 months they have reported there is no recurrence was noted and one uh, actually uh, people have gone further and they say uh, why why we are getting involved in all these uh, things why we don't uh, kill directly the latent uh, the cells which harbor the lat uh, latent viruses uh, this is still a experimental uh, thing and uh, this is uh, people are doing in the lab no no clinical human clinical trials or human case reports are reported uh, when christine has been shown to selectively kill the latent uh, viruses or the cell harboring the latent viruses in uh, human body but uh, yeah, we have to wait uh, mm -hmm. further for uh, yeah, getting anything to be done into the human beings and uh, as you know the combined approach uh, including the prophylactic as well as the treatment as well as the cellular immunity enhancement all those the, the combined things um, uh, may be the most uh, uh, appropriate approach but uh, practical uh, practically possible or not possible at present this is another issue drug resistance the most common uh, top three reasons for drug resistance is the cmv treatment itself the prolonged as you can see the prolonged C, uh, cmv treatment or previous antiviral drug uh, C, uh, antiviral cmv drug exposure or recurrence this is the these are the commonest cause of the uh, resistant gen generation and uh, another thing if uh, initially uh, if viral load is very high then then also it is possible to the resistant strains uh, becomes uh, after some time of the treatment actually this is important how resistance is uh, created Actually, what happens this uh, in the GAN cyclovir resistant virus mutates its the kinase genes, and when it is get mutated, actually this kinase is no longer uh, the uh, the uh, the kinase it uh, GAN cyclovir involved no longer uh, be, uh, remain useful, and now because of that this mutated kinases gan cyclovir cannot bind to these the new kinases and the virus start replicating again as you can see okay. because now the mutated kinases don't bind to the gan cyclovir and the replication again start phoscornate is the actually a very serious problem phoscornate resistance if it is there it is all it it gives resistance to all the uh, available drugs if phoscornet resistance is there, no drugs will work in any patient. And it, uh, why, uh, how it works? Actually, what happens? This uh, polymerase, uh, the actually phoscornet acts on the this uh, polymerase, and this this becomes mutated. In this case, when it gets mutated, actually this polymerase becomes able to use other viral kinases that is not targeted by any drug. And using those viral kinases that is not uh, meant for in uh, normal circumstances for a, a CMV attachment, and but CMV use start using those kinases, and uh, the virus uh, again start replicating, and in this way it it confers uh, resistance to all the antiviral anti CMV drugs. If phoscornet get uh, this uh, UL fifty four uh, virus uh, when, whenever by, uh, virus uh, becomes able to uh, mutate the UL54 or polymerase genes, this is very serious problem actually. And you can see uh, the longer the duration of antiviral treatment, the more the uh, incidence of resistance. And uh, this is the problem. The second one you can see the pol if polymerase get mutated, all the drugs become ineffective, and if kinase only gets mutated, only this GAN is uh, becomes ineffective. But this is the almost uh, you can't do anything if uh, polymerases get uh, mutated. And uh, these are the uh, definitions uh, uh, you can read. And I'm uh, when the res uh, it is the resistance when it is refractory actually. Whenever uh, refractive uh, in organ or resistance is there, we, we, we have no choice but use reserve drugs. 
and these are the usual drugs but we no longer work we are only left with phoscornate and pseudophobia and uh, you know if phoscornate is not working nothing will work now these two drugs have been uh, developed uh, and uh, they are reserved drugs also latermovir and uh, marbivavir actually they don't attack genome they act uh, after dna synthesis is completed and they attack the packaging okay they packaging and nuclear they, they attack on the these targets they they stop the packaging of the genomic uh, viral genome and uh, act, uh, creation of act, in this way creation of they stop the creation of active viral uh, particles and this mbv they they actually stop the egress from the uh, inside the nucleus it cannot come outside the nucleus virus viral particle and cannot get into the circulation in this way uh, these are uh, these acts when the uh, uh, genome has been mutated but uh, resistance is also reported with these two drugs also and our approach is we use the simultaneous application of systemic as well as intravitreal antiviral therapies only antiviral uh, as i have said injection cannot uh, get, uh, there is no protection to other eye and virus is in the circulation no doubt if we don't uh, if we don't uh, protect other eye it will get involved sometime in future if one eye has been involved so uh, intravitreal alone will not work in long term only iv treatment uh, the uh, by IV route actually drug concentration inside the ocular cavities or not uh, it is almost it is most of the cases suboptimal and it had to be supplemented by intravitreal injection uh, uh, once virus is uh, settled and replicating inside the eye. Uh, so far we have uh, not uh, uh, encountered any issues of myelosuppression or toxicity or resistance in hematological patients or solid organ transplant patient or BMT patient. So, uh, the, uh, uh, and uh, all the patients are uh, 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 doing well at present also. And though no recurrence was also not noted after the first episode of treatment. Uh, this is the viral and uh, uh, now, uh, as I said, the bacterial and fungal. Uh, the bacterial and fungal infection manifest mostly by endogenous in endophthalmitis. Bacterial, uh, viral also cause the endophthalmitis. CMB may also cause the endophthalmitis, but it is more common with uh, viral or uh, sorry, bacterial or uh, fungal agents. Actually, it is very rare. And how rare? Uh, all the published series, whether fungal or bacterial. Uh, specifically in hematoid disorders or all the cases of immunosuppression clubbed, it is not more than one on two cases across the globe per year. And no study has so far specifically document the intraocular uh, infection, uh, bacterial or uh, fungal infection in the hematological disorders or uh, uh, patient or immunos immunosuppression owing to the hematological treatments or post BMT. One thing is still not clear, ki why this is so rare or why incidence is so low, whether disease does not really occur or it is not well studied. There is a lot of public uh, issues of publication bias in these, case, uh, these cases because the heart mortality is very high. Nobody published the uh, pa uh, patient gets uh, uh, not uh, surviving, not living. The failure cases don't, uh, nobody like to publish. And only if very old and few cases are a few case series are available where the post mortem diagnosis is also established and cases are present. So uh, the rarity may be because of publication bias also, because uh, and uh, since the visual uh, 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 visual recovery is uh, most of the cases does not happen, visual prognosis is poor. So this is also the discouragement uh, people uh, uh, don't publish uh, uh, frequently of these cases. But uh, anyway, the, uh, whatever, uh, the, uh, these cases are uh, very rare and that is a good thing for patients. And our experience, we have uh, since 2021 received one case per year in, and all the three in hematological disorders. And uh, all the three has been treated and uh, doing well. I am uh, going to discuss with you. Actually, uh, uh, the 
full uh, full uh, talk about uh, talking about full pathogenesis of or full patho mechanisms uh, of the fungal infections or bacterial infection in hematological disorders are out of scope of this discussion but in very brief in very fungal infections are most common post bmt and with the advent of brci uh, uh, you as you know uh, b cell receptor uh, um, yeah, sorry uh, b cell uh, these are the newer kind of drug uh, uh, b cell uh, signal uh, receptor signal uh, signaling uh, inhibitors these are called uh, you may correct me and after the advent of these drugs invasion in infections are very common in one series it is almost 84% and uh, out of 84 54% were uh, fungal infection and th only 30 and 37 were bacterial so this uh, this new class of brci drugs these are uh, the in, uh, episodes of infection or cases of incidence of uh, invasive infection has increased very much and that is the also a uh, subject of a lot of debate and publications actually what do these brci class of drugs do they uh, uh, as as hematolo hematologist you know better than me these all inhibit the uh, btk that is the one of the type of ty tyrosine kinases and uh, that in turn uh, inhibit the b cell re receptor signaling signaling that is the brci and uh, uh, through the this again uh, utilizing one of another kinases that is present in neutrophils and uh, this all disrupt the slow rolling, uh, slow rolling of neutrophil over endothelium and reactive oxygen species release. And this means this is the disruption of innate immunity as well as second line innate immunity against fungus. And that is the main pathway so far reported or so far studies as far as this uh, signal, uh, signal uh, uh, inhibitors drugs are coming into the uh, fashion. Now, it is very interesting actually. What are the clinical features of endophthalmitis? In endogenous endophthalmitis particularly, uh, because other, uh, other endophthalmitis, that is the traumatic or post-operative endophthalmitis, clinical features are very much clear. Anybody, even the junior most resident will uh, immediately identify this is the case of endophthalmitis. But here you can see, any features may be may present or may not be present. Okay, there is no how this this endogenous end of thalmitis will present is still very much clear. It each patient in this way is unique. May there may not be any features, or there may be a lot of features, or there may be a mix of features in between all. And this is the problematic. The, because features disease may present and clinical features may be absent and this has the direct implication on the diagnosis and management as you understand these in these hematological patients despite being under regular care of super specialist often as in patient the prognosis and outcome of endogenous endophthalmitis is much much worse than other serious form of endophthalmitis that is post op and traumatic the worst the worst prognosis is this uh, endogenous endophthalmitis and the only reason the disease presents in very different way and diagnosis is uh, uh, very difficult uh, how it is difficult just see actually it is a kind of acute event clinical features are very much delayed and that means infection grow, grow very slowly even after well establishing itself intra, in intraocular space. And this is responsible for the de delayed referral and diagnosis. P patient is not actually understand patient is not directly in the care of he is in the hospital but not directly in care of the uh, ophthalmologist. He is in care of the nephrologist, hematologist. So and how you can as a hematologist how you can know when the patient could not uh, patient is not complaining anything there is no clinical sign there is no redness visible to you there is no vision loss complaint to you and this all makes the referral delayed though infection has already comes in the intraocular spaces and once it comes into the intraocular spaces this is the uh, it, it as i told it becomes an emergency 
but here there is nothing most of the time nothing to say that there is uh, anything is going wrong wrong inside the eyes and this all leads to the higher incidence of misdiagnosis labeled actually very curiously more, up to the 63 percent cases in one series labeled as normal by ophthalmologist itself understand Do, they are general ophthalmologist not retinal surgeons and that uh, uh, and uh, implication i am going to tell you so even patient comes to the ophthalmologist there is no uh, no guarantee that they are, they uh, they would be uh, uh, they would be diagnosed clearly and rightly after that diagnosis may be delayed so you can understand why the prognosis is worst in these cases and as a hematologist as a physician you must demand that patient must be seen by the retinal surgeons at the first insult not uh, instance not by the ophthalmologist general ophthalmologist because of the reason i uh, this is this uh, delayed diagnosis or misdiagnosis if because actually general ophthalmologists don't see these patients or don't see uh, uh, endophthalmitis patients regularly so, and here the presentation is very uh, uh, different and it is the uh, 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 not only different but in a very weird way the presentation so often general ophthalmologists get confused in these cases and as i told this this all makes prognosis worse since patient is under your care so your role uh, i will discuss the ophthalmologist part of uh, care later but hematologist physician souls are very much important in diagnosis of these cases how because you are the first to recognize something is not good something is bad you are the first to sus uh, become suspicious of something wrong and this will result in early referral and whenever refer pro please refer properly you demand it should you ensure it must be referred to retinal surgeon not general ophthalmologist it may be uh, delayed it may be diagnosis may be delayed or it may be misdiagnosed for a long time and most important thing even any ophthalmologist have seen these patients and lab patients are labeled normal do not forget for repeated examinations even in the in the you uh, i have just uh, i have uh, all, uh, we, i have listed these uh, references even in the very big center in the us patients were labeled normal at the first examination and only it is one or two or later on the same patient was diagnosed as the endovenous endophthalmitis Be because because presentation was in such a way and patients were not seen by retinal surgeons at first instance it was seen by general ophthalmologist it was seen by somebody else and uh, somebody else so even in the develop uh, the uh, the reports from developed nation and very advanced centers this problems happens so if even by bedside or by re uh, referral to the ophthalmology opd or anything patient is normal but insist insist for the repeated examination if you are suspecting anything in the immunosuppressed patient or hematological patients and as you understand disease recognition itself is the very most important determinant of proper management and it is your the favorable prognosis and it is it goes uh, at length in reducing mortality because there may not be fungemia there may, may not be bacteremia but there may be endogenous in, endophthalmitis and vice versa here also archit is here here also once the our patients were diagnosed as endo, endogenous endophthalmitis they start searching for whether there is another focus in the body or where there is uh, somewhere else infection is running on or not and uh, the uh, and then find something uh, only after that in the many of the cmv cases here also patients were uh, patient were uh, fever was treated by antibacterial agents and only when cmv retinitis was reported then the, uh, uh, the uh, everybody realized that the uh, uh, cmv replication has been started and it is the fever is because of this viral infection so uh, all the the high index of suspicion repeated examination and 
uh, knowledge of all these factors that diagnosis may be delayed may help a lot to you and this and uh, for anybody ophthalmologist or retinal surgeon for a hematologist that is the most important determinant i actually i have devised uh, this approach this is personal experience not validated for physicians in particularly in immunosuppression uh, immunosuppressed patients or hematological patient or post bmt even in remission red eye you should be alert red eye with pain you should be more alert you should be more uh, suspicious if red eye is little bit of lid edema it is more likely some infection some inflammation is in the eye and if it is associated with vision loss then uh, believe uh, me uh, it is the uh, more, more than 90% of the times it is uh, infectious disease running inside the eye and if all this combined the, then it is almost 100% diagnostic bedside that this patient is uh, of uh, uh, in this in these circumstances this patient has been, has been developed some kind of infection inside the eye but uh, and this is uh, i found it useful many a time now people actually facing all these problems people uh, started into another direction what they started doing somebody raises that why not uh, we, we why why we should not know beforehand that patient is going to develop endogenous endophthalmite ophthalmitis or any end organ disease similar to this and they start doing this routine or repeated cultures for bacteremia or fungemia surveillance all admitted patient or all uh, 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 outpatients after a fixed interval they start doing this thing but and what have uh, and another uh, but this failed actually i am showing you how, how it failed doing repeat culture or routine cultures for bacterial infection or a fungal infection won't work uh, in deciding the end organ disease okay people step uh, one is uh, went one step again further they they start studying these patient whether there are any predictive factors are present that uh, indicate that a patient is more uh, likely going to develop uh, endogenous end ophthalmitis or any end organ disease that also failed actually actually then people uh, people is, uh, then start foc uh, started focusing on the ocular ocular or in the organ disease itself. Somebody said, forget it, whether patient has bacteremia or fungemia, why we not say directly see the target organ routinely and start doing the fundus examination in asymptomatic patients. This also failed actually. Then this prophylactic treatment comes into the picture. And you know, the one of the etiologies frequently mentioned in your journals, hematology journals, that antibiotic prophylaxis is responsible for more number of IFIs in invasive fungal infections in these patients. This is nowadays, frequent, uh, nowadays no, not nowadays, but it is frequently reported. And it is listed one of the causes of invasive fungal infection prior antibiotic, antibiotic treatment in these patients. So it, this also is not uh, any guarantee that you are giving prophylactic treatment and uh, patient is the now uh, safeguarded from all the ills. And as I told, these are pretty unsettled issues as of now. There is more of personal choices rather than any uh, settled uh, standards. See, just see this routine blood culture thing. Actually, only significant finding is uh, statistical significance is immunosuppression that is uh, understood. Now see this one blood culture positive. 49% patients are normal. They, they don't have anything. And chorioretinitis, there is no chorioretinitis. So you can uh, uh, understand uh, what is the value of this doing this routine culture. Okay. And this non is sorry. Actually, this non-specific is uh, uh, findings that mimic like inflammation or uh, infective findings, but those are actually not inflammation or not, 
not infective. So one blood culture, there is nothing. These authors found actually when there are three or more than four blood cultures are positive, then there is the risk. But again, you see the risk is almost evenly distributed. Almost 50% patient, you may ex ex expect that the disease may, will be present and uh, almost 50% may be normal. So blood culture is not going to tell anything uh, doing routinely in uh, asymptomatic patients. It is the clinical clues that is more important. This is very large study from United States. They, they have, just see, patient, all the patient with endophthalmitis. And when it comes to the patient with bacteremia, fungemia, and endophthalmia, how, how, how many have left now? You understand? So most of the patient with bacteremia and fungemia, it means only 21, 22 have been developed endophthalmitis and rest of have the fungemia or bacteremia, but does not develop any endorgan disease. So at present, doing routine cultures or surveillance culture have no role in the management of these patients. Only it is the uh, problem to the patient and uh, uh, burden on infrastructure. Same is the story with India. It, these are the Indian publication and you just can read uh, the all the studies uh, reports very low rate of positive blood cultures in endogenous endophthalmia it is from 0 to 100 percent okay and uh, one explanation given that all patients receive prior intra intravenous antibiotic as a prof as a prophylaxis uh, antifungal and uh, antibiotics are given as a prophylaxis in almost all the hematological patient you know uh, you uh, you are the person who institute these treatments Now, the same story is here. Just see, uh, the only the significant finding, the more number of days, the duration is only significantly associated. That is understandable. The more, uh, the uh, longer the duration of sickness, longer the um, more the complications, not only infective, any all others. And this is, uh, again, uh, the, the, uh, what we have talked that was fungemia, and it is uh, exclusive bacterial endophthalmitis, and the findings are the same, that blood cultures of no use in asymptomatic patient. Now the, predict, uh, now the uh, predictive factors. People, uh, they, they, they have uh, studied very extensively a lot of factors in these patients. And in the hope, if any factor can predict the uh, future onset of the end organ disease, including end ophthalmitis, but what they found, though leukemia and lymphoma in these patients were uh, clinically significant, uh, sorry, statistically significantly associated, but all other factors are almost most of the only if you see the older age or fungal uh, or comorbidities along with uh, endogenous endophthalmitis like a uh, patient has uh, endophthalmitis and fungal meningitis or tuberculosis simultaneously. That is understandable. Those, those patients are very sick patients. Otherwise, asympto patient, asymptomatic patient, only leukemia, lymphoma, no doubt. These are the factors for the endogenous endophthalmitis. We, we are talking about this uh, for one hour. And these are the statistically significantly associated with, uh, with the uh, onset of. But all other factors are not. Only thing, longer the duration of the disease, the longer the hospital stay, the more the, uh, more the significantly uh, uh, associated with the onset of end of thalmitis, whether the risk and odds and relatives are not so, uh, not as, uh, uh, there is only a trend uh, visible. Not uh, those are not actually uh, statistically significant in this disease also. Uh, this uh, study also. So now the this uh, uh, this culture and all these productive things are over. Now people started focusing on the fundus itself or any other organ, brain or whatever. This is the study. Uh, they what they studied. They studied all the fungi. Uh, uh, Ocular, um, all the patients between six and nine, ocular involvement by fungal organisms. 
and all the patient were received the in uh, uh, this uh, yeah, fundus examination bedside or in uh, opd where, wherever no pediatric patient and only two adult patient had positive finding that is chorioretinitis or endophthalmitis okay only two patient out of 211 the routine fundus examination was done for a time in two uh, more than 200 patient on only two patients were fine uh, were found to have the uh, involvement therefore the this uh, this is done into the united states and the what they suggest uh, concluded that routine ophthalmic consultation on fungemic patients is not an efficient uh, use of clinical resources however validation of these findings via prospective study is desired so this also is no longer practice or no longer recommended but doing at frequent intervals or at fixed intervals of fundus examination or visit by ophthalmologist is not a bad thing we do here we do we even the in 66 patient for our hematology colleagues uh, many of uh, are you listening now you send to us patient just for routine if patient is admitted or patient is care under care uh, in your department regularly you send and that is not the bad thing right if, if, if it is feasible it is not a bad thing because it is non invasive test it is uh, very simple only we have to look at the eyes we have to look inside the eyes and if uh, if even one case we can pick in a year of this serious disorder this is not a bad thing actually uh, now the prophy prophylactic treatments actually value of these systemic prophylaxis whether fungal or bacterial is not known and all the guidelines have not been uh, had have, have not been validated by vigorous studies and uh, the studies included are mostly case series you should uh, randomized series uh, randomized uh, trials are included in uh, development of guidelines and uh, those are not actually uh, the authors themselves accepted those are not of, of very good quality randomization uh, randomized studies so uh, what is the value of these prophylaxis treatment empirical uh, treatment preemptive treatment is not known in as far as uh, as far as end organ pre prevention including endogenous endophthalmitis this this has uh, these things have to be seen into the future what is coming out and these are the two the uh, these uh, these are the two, one for fungal and one for bacterial guidelines i found uh, in hematological journals and this the uh, i have chosen this is for, uh, uh, from germany and because these are the these uh, most exhaustive uh, guidelines they have included most number of studies most number of good studies so uh, you have to decide uh, you have to tell me what is the value of these guidelines nowadays and uh, this is the relative comparison uh, of the primary prophylaxis empirical and uh, preemptive though uh, primary uh, prophylaxis there is all patients are given the antifungals or antibacterial the cost is uh, the uh, problem uh, it is simple to institute simple to implement but preemptive and empirical it is very resource uh, intensive therapy lot lot of expertise are needed lot of resources are needed very advanced uh, uh, techniques are, uh, technology is needed that is the problem though they reduce the antifungal and antibacterial uh, uh, um, drugs uh, uses very low but the uh, problem is there are very uh, very much uh, resource in intensive and for the endogenous end of the now the ophthalmologist part here the same problem no treatment guidelines available because of rarity of disease is one factor and uh, and another factor the time the patient is identified properly diagnosed properly that is very late actually and uh, that time it's very difficult to treat uh, these patient and therefore treatment varies widely mostly it is the individualized treatment we are doing at present uh, each center from one center to one center and uh, their experiences their past experiences they decide the treatment mostly rather than any standard uh, fixed treatment beforehand and the uh, one more thing these every patient is very unique just you see the bmt post bmt patient the uh, 
uh, AML, C ALL, all these patients are very unique. They have very different, each patient has very different kind of disease characteristic, patient characteristic. They're not, uh, uh, just imagine one patient is hematological uh, suffering from also having the diabetes. So uh, you can't fix the treatment. You have to uh, uh, innovate and improve yourself with each patient. Many patients, uh, just like those uh, comorbidities are present, patient also has meningitis, patient also have uh, the prostatic uh, abscesses. So uh, usually we give uh, after vitrectomy uh, oral visalon, uh, oral uh, steroids uh, for at least uh, one week full doses and later taper on. But how we will uh, give into that prostatic abscess patient, that, that becomes a problem. So you can uh, understand the, uh, the, the treatment cannot be, uh, 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 cannot make made common to all one uh, pre decided treatment. Uh, there must be some individualization in each uh, with each patient. So there is the role of each person of op ophthalmologist uh, care for ocular infection by medical and surgical means. Hematologist uh, actually once endogenous end of uh, as you see many of the time end of thalmitis is present, but no other problem patient is facing. There is no other focus identified. There is no bacteremia. There is no fungemia. So if we, when we report that patient has this end of thalmitis thing, then hematologist also become, uh, uh, comes into the role because eye infection has come somewhere from uh, through the blood streams so, and somewhere from the other structures in the body. And that is the job of hematologists to search and identify those, uh, uh, those uh, loci or locus where from where this infection has come through blood, blood stream inside the eyes. So uh, system is how... Uh, uh, since uh, ocular uh, ocular infection, the uh, the nature of ocular infection, the etiology can be decided only after the culture or micros uh, largely by the culture. In between that time, how the systemic infection will be controlled, it is the purely hematologist. Uh, whether hematologist can give us a clue that somewhere else this organism has been identified, this organism has been uh, we we found this access or this thing at another uh, locus. So. Uh, the, the, these all responsibilities comes to the hematologist. Hematologist and ophthalmologist both are needed simultaneously to decide the management when the need for modification in immunosuppressive therapy arises, particularly in viral infections, or sometimes uh, uh, sometimes in uh, uh, bacterial or fungal infection. Because as I said, uh, we need to give the uh, the. the the treatment is a vitrectomy, immediate vitrectomy. And we need to give the uh, uh, oral steroids or a steroid in some, uh, by some route because post, uh, just to prevent the post-operative inflammation because that will become itself a danger to the patient's side. So uh, the, uh, in, the, in those circumstances, actually we need a very good coordination. And uh, fortunately our center ha has uh, this coordination very well established. So uh, that and that may be the reason of a good outcome in our patients. And we follow this vitrectomy. We do immediate, we, we recommend immediate vitrectomy if possible, as early as or whenever possible. This is the only treatment for endophthalmitis. And vitrectomy is done for two purposes. First of all, we, we must try to get undiluted vitreous samples. That is the only way to, to ensure what kind of uh, organism you are facing with. And there is no other way. And vitrectomy is the only tool you can get these samples properly and undiluted. But this is the surgically demanding thing. You, uh, this is the, this, uh, getting undiluted samples are not an easy thing. And uh, this needs... Uh, uh, you you understand why there is a lot of negative vitreous samples are reported as we have seen. Even at the good centers, up to 60% of vitreous samples are reported negative. And But the issue is it is really negative or you have not a good quality sample. This is, uh, this is very important. Most of the time, what I think it is the 
samples are not proper. You draw, you have drawn not a proper sample that results in the negative sampling. And this is one thing to get proper samples and reduce the load as much as possible. Reduce the debris as much as possible inside the eyes. In that way, you reduce the uh, bacteria or fungal load and you are creating a space to drugs get inside the eye and it may disperse because if you don't remove the pus, it is very hard. This The amount injected uh, of intervital uh, microbials, antimicrobials are very little. You need some space and it is impossible if there is pus, is, uh, the eye is filled with pus and you uh, your antibiotics or antifungals are dispersing properly and getting it to its target to cure your patient. So vitrectomy is the only tool to treat these patients if possible. And if possible, do as early. We try to do uh, immediately the same day or as early. Many times we can't because of the uh, patient uh, problems. Patient has, um, uh, just imagine patient is having fever and patient, uh, patient cannot uh, be given anesthesia or many other things. So, but uh, whenever, uh, but uh, we recommend immediate vitrectomy. Even after vitrectomy, intravitreal antimicrobials may be needed. May, may be needed to repeated every forty yard, eight hours for a long time. Otherwise, infection will come again. Whatever you have uh, removed from vitrectomy, not going to be stable. And if you stop the intravitreal antimicrobial uh, soon after the vitrectomy, this is this will create again a problem. <clears throat> intravitreal antibiotics only no surgical treatments, only injections as an initial treatment in the cases where vitrectomy is not possible by various by virtue of various factors I have told. Patient is not fit for surgery. One thing, these are usually sick patient. Patient, uh, there, they, there may be a bleeding problem that we can't immediately take into the patient for surgery. In that cases, the at least antibiotics should be injected inside the eye. So at least uh, the uh, the infection can be controlled if not uh, eliminated or if not cleared, at least uh, replication should be controlled, must be controlled. And sometimes exudates and exudates and pus is so badly filled that you ha don't have any space to go inside. Your vitrectomy port cannot get inside the eyes. It is so bad situation. Okay, understand. So the giving antibiotics for one or two days reduces these exudates and uh, infection pus and at least uh, we can make a uh, make a uh, incision for facilitating the vitrectomy because making incision is not possible many a time in these patients. Choice of systemic drug agents it is influenced by multiple factors. One thing uh, by the past experiences experiences of your center uh, because uh, culture is not uh, uh, culture reports are not immediately available. Only thing, uh, KOH preparation can give the idea whether fungus is present or not, but what fungus is there, it is not clear until we get the uh, culture report. So it is influenced by multiple factors. And uh, sometimes uh, uh, hematologists are okay, our patients getting this type of infections uh, more in, in the past. So we, we should start this uh, agent uh, so first hand before any culture reports come. So this is the uh, uh, this comes out of uh, the discussion between us. But we uh, we give oral ciprofloxacin 750 mg in every case, in each case, because of the very good concentration maintained inside the eye, the ciprofloxacin or even oral in the dosage of 750 mg BD, the very high concentration is uh, achieved inside the ocular inside the eye intraocularly. And this is the uh, this covers most of the gram positive as well as negative spectrum. And uh, in the uh, antifungal side, we use voriconazole. Uh, uh, hematology uh, hematology department gives posaconazole, but we don't. Uh, one reason uh, in, uh, posaconazole is not available for intravitreal injection. And uh, our experience is uh, we have. Uh, Voriconazole has very good response in all the patients so far we have seen. So we give oral as well as uh, topical uh, intravitreal, all three routes. Voriconazole as an antifungal is preferred by us. And final is the final uh, therapy is started culture and sensitivity. We don't follow these three things. Though 
in the literature, you get the plenty of uh, people advocating these treatments. Systemic treatment alone, intravitreal alone, or vitrectomy alone. Vitrectomy would not work if you have not giving intravitreal antibiotic later on after vitrectomy or in the absence of systemic treat, systemic cover. So alone, these won't work. We have these all three must be combined, starting from the vitrectomy and systemic treatment, or at least vitrectomy should be done. After that, systemic treatment can be instituted if we have some kind of reports available. So and intravitreal must be continued even after the vitrectomy till you are sure or there is evidence of uh, infection no longer present there or it is it is getting inactivated. We won't have so far whatever patient we have received. Negative sampling is not a problem. We are, all the sample our all the samples comes with positive results. We, we have identified the agent. We have identified the even species and um, bacterial or fungal. And it is the most more the quality of vitreous samples that decides positive or negative. It must be undiluted from within exudates. That is surgically demanding thing. And uh, surgery uh, surgery is uh, not very easy to get undiluted samples from within the cavities. And uh, if you have good quality sample, even intravitreal antimicrobials have been given prior before you get the samples at uh, another center or by you. Even in those cases, these sample seals, these samples come positive. That indicates to think that intravitreal alone cannot control these infection. It took me removal of uh, ma uh, manual removal of the pus or infection is uh, needed along with these intravitreal antimicrobials. And second thing, if you are getting undiluted and exudative uh, 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 sample, it will become positive and it will tell you what the organism uh, you are facing with. So uh, this is the thing. Uh, we uh, it, these are the, our experiences, and these are the newer molecular techniques, the more of a research tool, and uh, pan fungal and pan bacterial PCR uh, actually. Uh, uh, I don't believe I, I I believe in culture sensitivity thing more, but uh, people uh, in negative cases people resort to this fungal. But nowadays many hospitals start from pan fungal and pan fung bacterial PCR. They at first uh, as soon as they receive the patient they try to get some intraocular fluid and subject it to the fungal and bacterial. Though people recommend it for negative cases. And uh, uh, this DNA sequencing or high throughput uh, sequencing, uh, these are the availabilities and an issue. And uh, mostly it is the lab based or lab specific uh, technique uh, at, as of now. And biomarkers, uh, based on the biomarkers uh, and make uh, 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 for diagnosis or management is not, not successful because most of the studies show there is no real difference between asymptomatic or normal patient and in the ophthalmitis patient. Uh, the concentration is almost same in both the sites. So the, there is no uh, really clinically trans, uh, clinically useful information or clinically useful tool coming out of these things. Our the cases of the three cases, the first case was the PNH uh, case, under not under emission, but under treatment at and this case, we received peak COVID time. So we could not image this patient. There is no photographs available, fundus or so, because uh, uh, in a very difficult circumstances, we get in the patient was patient get inside the patient and we are we were able to uh, operate upon this patient uh, because their uh, OTs were closed, OPDs were closed, hospitals were totally closed, only COVID hospital was running. And it comes out candida, uh, candida albicans. And the patient is uh, now, uh, vision was restored. Patient is leading normal life at present. And uh, our our uh, plan, uh, our treatment was immediate vitrectomy along with uh, intravitreal and systemic all. This was again the patient uh, CML under treatment and patient was ICU in that time for some cardiac problem. The, and uh, because of that, we could not image this patient also. And it comes actually here, uh, somebody has taken vitreous tap and it came negative. So th th that was the reason I, I go for retinal biopsy uh, during vitrectomy. And uh, 
and um, there was no fungemia and bacteremia as in case one and the, this uh, th that yielded and it was the aspergillus and uh, we successfully again uh, though i was safe but vision was not cannot be restored because it is very bad uh, infection and uh, in uh, most of the retina was involved already before operation and but patient is in at present remission and leading normal life this is the third patient is still uh, we have received few days back this is the b scan uh, the there was not so media was so packed we could not see inside this was the, this is a totally pus filled vitreous cavity you can see and uh, again this is the uh, patient developed redness and uh, 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 lead edema and uh, watering 25 days before uh, post bmt at another center the case was the b a l l and uh, it is still under uh, presently we have uh, we did uh, vitrectomy and uh, voriconazole m4b was both give, being given at present and patient is actually much better after uh, the 10 or 10 or 12 days has been passed after vitrectomy but patient is much better and it was the actually the koh was the uh, koh shown the numerous fungus hy fungal hyphae uh, fungal uh, uh, hyphae on the koh preparation and so it was uh, fungal in ophthalmitis we are waiting for the culture reports and uh, these are the actually uh, uh, published case uh, I have taken from published cases. This is the chorioretinitis. Uh, this is much of uh, uh, use of ophthalmologist rather than you, you hematologist. And this is the end of thalmitis. This is a candida end of thalmitis. This is chorioretinitis, only single lesion without any other, without vitreous inflammation. And here you can see some haziness. Uh, you might not perceive it uh, because you don't see these patients. So overlaying vitreous uh, haziness, uh, these patients were diagnosed as the uh, endophthalmitis. Uh, 